Welcome. In the preceding weeks, we've been sharing the lives and deaths of eight French Jesuit missionaries who came to this part of the world, Canada, and Upper New York State in an effort to bring the word of Jesus to the Native Americans who lived here. They suffered great hardships and finally died the deaths of martyrs at the hands of those whom they came to convert. Conversion did come about, the Indians in great numbers, and the missionaries came back. They built shrines to those fallen eight brothers who gladly gave up their lives so that Jesus could rule in this land. Come with us now as we share the joy of the shrines erected to the black robes, the North American martyrs. Hello, family. We're here with Father Jim Farrell, who is the director of the Shrine of the North American Martyrs in Midland, Ontario, Canada, just north of New York State, a powerful pilgrim place in our own continent. Father's going to share with us some of the insights that we have, we've received about the martyrs of North America. I just said to Father Farrell that uh, we studied intensely about the martyrs, uh, especially the North American martyrs. And uh, as you read about them, yes, tears do come to your eyes. But it's not until you have stood on this ground. Holy ground ground, holy ground that is, has been drenched by the blood of martyrs, the water that you see are in this area, beautiful, beautiful lakes that are red with the blood of the martyrs, that you come to terms with the way of the cross, the price that they willingly paid. And so, uh, family, welcome on this pilgrimage to the land of martyrs, the martyrs that died for our continent, our country, that we might have a strong, faithful church. And Father Farrell started to tell us about the, His Holiness the Pope. In, in, 19, in 1644, when the, the Pope was asked if he would give permission to Isaac Jog to say Mass, although his fingers had been chewed off as part of his torture, uh, the Pope granted the permission that a martyr of Christ should be able to drink the blood of Christ, mm -hmm. but he also made the chapel here uh, at St. Marie a place of pilgrimage, at that time the only one nor um, north of Mexico. And this is a copy of it by Urban VIII in 1644. Then when the mission was destroyed and everything had disappeared, uh, this church was built to honor the martyrs, and the pri uh, privilege of being a place of pilgrimage was transferred to this church. We asked Father Farrell if there were any relics left from the time of the martyrs, considering that everything had been destroyed by the uh, Indians and also by the Jesuits before they left here. Everything in here is from the actual time of the martyrs. For, first of all, there is a post. And when the martyrs burnt down, uh, Father Ragino uh, decided they'd burn down the St. Marie rather than let it become a fortress for the Iroquois. These posts had been put in the ground at the time of Brebeuf and Lalma. The top is burnt off, the rest was in sand, as good as the day they were put in. You have here a nail from the coffin of Brebeuf, the actual coffin. You have earth from the actual coffin too, and a medal and a rosary uh, from the graves that are across the road at St. Marie. How did they know? When we looked at the skull, we looked at the skull of uh, Father de Brebeuf and, and the, the relics. How did they know that these were the actual uh, relics of these saints? But I understand it's very well documented uh, from the day of their death. Yes, when they decided to leave here, then they decided these men had suffered so much that someday they might be made saints, and they dug up the graves, took off the flesh, and wrapped them in silk and carried them then back to Quebec. Uh, and uh, they were in Quebec, and, and pieces of it went to the families in France, and pieces, mm -hmm. and then uh, Father Casso, I think the priest's name was, he gave them to the Ursulines, mm -hmm. and, and the Ursulines and the Hospitallers had uh, part of them. And then in 1925, when they were beatified, mm -hmm. we didn't have a relic at all. The Jesuits didn't have a relic at all. Those relics were divided, and that's when the half of... Uh, Brebeuf's skull came to us. These are the relics of the martyrs. We only have relics from three of them, St. John de Brebeuf, St. Gabriel Alma, and St. Charles Garnier. The others were either burnt in their, a fire, thrown into the fire, or they were drowned. 
But for those three, we have six pieces of the bone of Brebeuf and Alma in this reliquary. And here we have the skull of Brebeuf plus a large relics of Lalma and Garnier. <laughs> this is carried by Champlain, the governor of that time, by Goupil, a donné, who gave their talents for the, for the uh, missions, and um, a Huron chief, and Brebeuf, the missionary. So four categories of people that were here at that time. You see a little picture to the side in which the Pope is kneeling in front of these uh, reliquaries and praying. Many people have done that over the years. The people pray here to the martyrs, ask their intercession, and then uh, those canes and crutches and braces are things that people leave here in appreciation for the cure. And we have a doctor's letter on file saying he can't explain it. He may not call it a miracle, but he, he can't explain it. Uh, I've been here since 1981. I haven't seen a miracle. I have seen hundreds of people who find peace of soul. They come here and just pray, and they find peace. The martyrs call this the home of peace, and I can honestly say there are many people who come here, and they find that peace. It's still in the grounds or the soil uh, that the martyrs uh, lived on and where they died and where they lie buried. Okay, it's amazing. When I was listening to Father speak about peace, this has become known as a shrine of peace. Peace? There was such violence done in this area. Peace? Yes. The way of the cross. Again, Jesus and the way of the cross. So these martyrs, through their crucifixion, through their martyrdom, brought about resurrection, brought about peace. We find that <clears throat> in researching these martyrs for this television series and in writing the book, they were surrounded by violence. They were encompassed by violence, and yet they themselves were given the gift of the peace of our Lord Jesus. They suffered in peace, they died in peace, and yet all around them, it, it, it's like Holocaust is happening all around you, and yet you are in the bosom of our Lord Jesus and our Mother Mary, and peace is all around you. I remember the martyrs saying that one of the, the sufferings that they had was not only the rejection, but mostly when they could not have enough time to pray. So peace came through their prayer. Um, they say that with uh, St. John de Brebeuf, he uh, was like set like steel, as if he was impervious to the pain. That peace, that inner peace that gives us such inner strength. I don't know whether you noticed that the church honors the martyrs, and, uh, and yet the church is dedicated to St. Joseph. When you come up the front steps, the statue of St. Joseph is on the front. Mm -hmm. When you look above the tabernacle, the statue of St. Joseph is there. Because the original church uh, was the ch chapel of St. Joseph across the road. He, they, they, he was their patron. And uh, when this church was built, the martyrs weren't yet, uh, were just beatified, so they weren't saints. And, but it honors them, but is dedicated to St. Joseph. Father John Fillon, S.J., had the dream to make a shrine to the North American martyrs here on the hill above the mission of Sainte Marie, which had been such an important part of their ministry. This had been where the missionaries would look up the river to see if their companions were returning from Quebec. Here, Saint Jean de Brebeuf had his garden of prayer, where he had a vision of the cross. The site of St. Marie below and on the river had been excavated and identified as the site of the original mission. Father Fillon was able to generate great interest in the site on the occasion of the beatification of the North American martyrs in 1925. Mass was celebrated by the Archbishop of Toronto. 10,000 people gathered around the ruins of the mission and registered interest in having a shrine built. Father Fillon bought the property in the name of the Society of Jesus in 1925 and went about building a church which would accomplish two important ends. 
The interior had to project the dream of Father Isaac Jogues, who built the original church at Sainte Marie. And it had to project the culture of the people the black robes came to evangelize. With that in mind, you see how the roof of the church is in the form of an upside down canoe, which was the way the natives carried their canoes overland to protect them and their cargo from rain and snow. The canoe was also stored on top of the longhouse, again, as a form of protection. So the sides of the church are built in the form of a Native American longhouse. The other goal of the church was to project a typical French country church found in Brittany or Normandy. So the exterior is classical French with the brick of a country church. It seemed as if the Lord was working overtime all over the world in order to give Father Filion whatever he needed for his church in honor of the martyrs. A church in Toronto was being dismantled to build a new church. They didn't want the old altar rails, communion rail, the beautiful rose stained glass windows, or the pews. So Father Filion took advantage of it. He put them in his new church. The Cathedral of London was being renovated. They didn't want their Stations of the Cross. Father Filion took them. As an extra added gift, the Lord gave Father Filion 26 stained glass windows from the Cathedral in London. They had been painted in Germany. Lumber companies donated most of the lumber needed for the shrine. Some 50 workers spent most of the year putting the building up. By June the 25th, 1926, a little over a year after Father Fillon had bought the property, the church was ready for the official opening. We asked Father Farrell to share with us about the Pope's visit here. Um, he visited here in 1984, uh, just 10 years ago. Yeah. Did, did he say anything that you recall, especially? Do you recall anything that he might have said? Well, just being present with him was one big thing. Mm -hmm. But that, uh, no, he was interested in the martyrs. Anything in the church, things that we thought he would just walk by, he, he stopped to look at the uh, mannequins of the martyrs to pray at the Blessed Sacrament altar. Uh, the, the most impressive thing for me was he reached out to everybody. If the sick were in here, sick and crippled, mm -hmm. and he reached as far as he could reach to, to welcome everybody. Suffering and sickness and death itself are part of the mystery of life. But while they remain a mystery, they need not be without meaning. I pray that you will have the spiritual strength to accept your difficult crosses and not to lose courage. Dear brothers and sisters, may the Lord Jesus make you strong in faith and hope and fill your hearts with peace and joy. He spent so much time with each person who was ill, and this has always been our experience, uh, Bob and my, myself and our ministry, when we have brought the sick to uh, an audience. The sick always have that honored place in St. Peter's Basilica or in the, the hall, the audience hall. And uh, I have had the uh, privilege once myself in a wheelchair and other times with uh, pilgrims. Uh, I've always brought the sick up there. And, and the Pope will stop and look and hold and, and speak to each one of them. Right. That tremendous love that he had. Again, the love of the martyrs for the flock. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, 
pray. With this traditional Euron word of welcome, I greet you all, and in a special way, I greet the native peoples of Canada, the descendants of the first inhabitants of this land, the North American Indians. We also recall how the worthy traditions of the Indian tribes were strengthened and enriched by the gospel message. These new Christians knew by instinct that the gospel had the power to purify and uplift the cultural heritage. His Holiness then went from the Church of the Martyrs to the reconstructed mission of St. Marie among the Hurons. The officials showed him through the shrine as the workers recreated conditions as they existed at the time of the Jesuit missionaries. They actually took the parts of the Donés who had done the physical work at that time. They tried to make the setting as realistic as possible so that His Holiness would be able to envision the work that was being done by the Jesuits at that time, their struggles and their hardships. He had to pass over canoes, which were used for transportation up and down the rivers from Quebec to St. Marie. Then they led him into the Church of St. Joseph, the first church in this mission. While the mission is a masterpiece of construction, for our intents and purposes, the most important area is the original Church of St. Joseph, which, which was built by St. Isaac Jogues. Here, the priests celebrated Mass for the Indian converts and also gave them religious instructions. This is the church referred to as the first religious shrine north of Mexico, which was given the gift of the plenary indulgence in 1644 by Pope Urban VIII. Within the church is the original burial place of Saint Jean de Brébeuf and Saint Gabriel Lalamont. After their brutal torture and execution, the black robes brought their bodies back to Sainte Marie and buried them here. At St. Marie among the Hurons, descendants of the Wendat Indians, as the Hurons called themselves, took His Holiness through a tour of what their ancestors' lives would have been like. They showed him the way the food was prepared outside the longhouses during the summer. These Native Americans played the part of Christian converts who lived at the missions and were trained here in the faith. There was a little girl who could very possibly have been Blessed Kateri Tekawitha. She looked so much like her. She stole His Holiness's heart. He followed them into what was a typical Native American longhouse, which is the way in which their ancestors carried on the extended family living. As he walked in, his eyes traveled over the longhouse, where anywhere from 30 to 50 people of one family would have lived. This was determined by the oldest woman in the tribe. Anyone who was related to her would have been considered part of her extended family. He saw the corn husks being dried on the ceiling of the longhouse. They showed him the bunks in which the Native American family slept during the time of the Jesuit missionaries. He saw the skins on the beds which were used as bed coverings. Then he sat with them in the same way as the Native American families would have sat for meetings or dinner. One of the things that we learn from the history of our church is always, uh, St. Paul did it when he went to Greece and to Turkey, is to learn about the culture and the people. How can you reach them? Jesus taught through the soil, through things that grow, through the sky. Uh, uh, Paul taught through his experience as a city boy. Here, when the Jesuits came, they first needed to learn the people, about the people, their language, what were their needs, 
uh, how could they communicate heart to heart as well as mind to mind. And so there was an interchange of cultures. As part of our videotaping the shrines of the North American martyrs, we went to the mission of St. Marie of the Hurons in Midland, Ontario, Canada. What began as a chapel and residence for the priests grew into 20 buildings, which included a church, a hospital, workshops, a stable, barns, cookhouse, a garden, a blacksmith shop, living quarters for the Donays and for the native converts. It was fortified by a log enclosure and stone embankments. The Jesuits and the Hurons, they had a village here that was self-sufficient. They uh, did not want to rely on uh, the uh, resources from and the Jesuits from Quebec, so they grew their own, they raised their own livestock, they grew their own vegetables, and uh, this is very typical of the way the Hurons um, planted. Uh, a very interesting thing that the Native Americans knew and probably taught to the French, or who knows, but anyway, it was to you take from the soil, then you let the soil rest and replenish itself, and then, which would we do today, which is ro called rotate farming. Rotate. Now this, this was also a very strong fortress. I don't believe it was ever successfully attacked during the 10 years that they were here. That is true. In other words, people would actually come here uh, when, when the little villages were being attacked in the, in the surrounding areas, this was meant to be the permanent settlement so there wouldn't be the going back and forth from Quebec except when necessary. But the priests could live here, the stock could be here, they would be self-sufficient in what they grew. It was meant to be like the missions of California where they would teach the natives how to do all these things and the natives would then become self-sufficient. Uh, another interesting thing uh, which we will show you is that the Jesuits built village homes where when the uh, Hurons would come here to learn, they would be comfortable, homes that were like theirs, uh, to stay and, and probably to encourage them, as Chris said, to encourage them to uh, remain longer to learn. Our eyes follow, we look over here, and this was a lookout. And uh, am I correct, uh, Chris, that lookout was so that the Jesuits could see uh, the other Jesuits, other missionaries returning from Quebec, but was it also a lookout to see if there were enemies uh, coming as well? Yes, exactly. Uh, throughout the uh, different corners of uh, the mission community, there are um, um, lookouts similar to this one here in which they could uh, um, see if any of the Iroquois were, were coming to the area and uh, planning an attack. Would you have been exposed to any danger at being a That's lay that, person? Yeah. You're, you're a Frenchman. You're not really a priest, you're not a missionary, and I don't think the French were in any danger from the, uh, the oh. Iroquois, were they, or were they? Well, St. Marie itself was never attacked, but the, I guess the threat of the Iroquois was always in this area, uh, a number of Huron villages and at which probably some of the Dunnays were aiding the Jesuit fathers building a mission amongst the Huron people were attacked, and a mm -hmm. number of the Jesuit fathers themselves had lost their lives in the area. So I think as far as a, a threat of of life, um, it was always, always there. Always present. Now you've asked us many times why we don't write about lay saints. We are always writing about priests and religious. Well, two of the North American martyrs, Jean Lalande and René Goupil, were both lay missionaries. They were Donés, which is what Peter here is representing. Donés were laymen who came over to the missions, the Jesuit missions in uh, North America and worked as volunteers. Originally, uh, the Donays wanted to be part of, like, oblates of the uh, Jesuits. They wanted to take the uh, same uh, re uh, vows of poverty, uh, um, chastity, and obedience. And uh, the Jesuits uh, uh, went to their superiors asking for permission. And after quite a bit of deliberation, it was not granted. 
and so, uh, but a, um, a mandate came down from Rome, and it was that although they did not take the vows, the uh, dones were to be obedient. Uh, they, if they did not do their work properly, and if they uh, um, were not in keeping with the Jesuit uh, charism that there was here, they were understood that they were to be let go, and so. Uh, they really lived the life without formally uh, taking the vows. We want to give special thanks to the government of Ontario for paying tribute to the North American martyrs who labored in this area of Ontario, and also for giving the martyrs credit for having played a great part not only in the evangelization, but in the civilization of this country.